All right, ladies. To the supernatural and then confirm that it actually can impact the natural world, we're stuck, which is why science relies on methodological naturalism. You seem to be able to do it with psychedelic drugs. You seem to be able to do what with psychedelic drugs? Well, everybody that takes them in, in under, under reliable settings generally comes back and, and claims the presence of a mystical experience. Yeah, and that seems to be du duplicatable and replicable across cultures in labs with multiple different substances, the chemical constituents of which are known very well. It's like it's part of this religious phenomenology. And to me, that's just a set of facts. And we know that people have been using those substances to evoke mystical and religious experiences for, who knows, 150,000 years maybe. Sure. We can at least infer that. And we have no, no idea whatsoever how much of an effect the use of those substances has had on the metaphysical substrate of our culture. Like, so what constitutes scientific data here is by no means clear. Here's an example of this, for example. So well, be before okay, the example, yeah? as someone who's been high as a kite, <laughs> I, I fully agree that people take drugs and report experiences that they describe as mystical or supernatural, just like people record, report other experiences as if they were religious or ghosts or whatever. We have no way of confirming that this something mystical or supernatural actually can happened. What this is, this is about the Stops language. Stops people from smoking. Well, you can stop smoking without any sort of supernatural intervention. No, not really. You can't stop smoking without supernatural? There aren't really any, any reliable chemical means for inducing smoking cessation. You can use a drug called bupropion. I think that's the one. It's whatever Wellbutrin is. Um, is that supernatural? To, no, you don't need a supernatural effect, but it doesn't work very well. But if you give people magic mushrooms, psilocybin, and they have a mystical experience, they have about an 85% chance of smoking cessation sure, with but, one treatment. But yeah, but that's kind of like evidence, you know. It, it's kind of like evidence. It's and evidence that you can take mushrooms mm -hmm. and increase your chance of quitting smoking. But no, it's, it's not. It's, it's indication that if you take mushrooms and you have a mystical experience, you'll, you'll stop smoking because it doesn't work. Okay, if you, if you take mushrooms and you have an experience that you describe as mystical, um, then you'll increase your chance of smoking. But that doesn't tell me whether or not there was something uh, to this notion that they had an experience that was supernatural in any sense. Well, it's not definitive evidence. It's, but it's not evidence, evidence at all. Oh, sure it is. Oh, sure it is. No, it, How is it? Wait a second. Wait a second. This that's is, wrong. Okay. It is evidence. So because, look. look no, he's you, right. You, you want right. to think through this skeptically. That. Okay. You have a pharmacological substance, it's psilocybin. You give it to people who are trying to, commit, to quit smoking. The psilocybin doesn't directly have an impact on the smoking behavior. It has to elicit what's described subjectively as a mystical experience. And you can get physiological indicators of that mystical experience. And you might say, well, that's not enough to prove that it's a mystical experience, but you know, you're conscious and I accept that. It's like you accept all sorts of things without being able to demonstrate their, their validity on every... <laughs>
people who are dealing with leaving atheism, uh, leaving their Christianity and turning towards atheism problems with the Bible, you know, classic atheism 101 type of shit. And he has 13,000 subscribers. And I had to sit there and think to myself, well, what am I doing wrong per se? Or how can I go better at doing what I am doing? With a little bit of research and a little bit of careful uh, note-taking, and I do mean a lot of... Uh, why is it so bright? A lot of note-taking, as you can see. I, I came onto something, and I think the idea is that YouTube already has so much diverse content that I think what is necessary for me and for this channel to be successful is to narrow the content that I am doing and without, right? Cause I like politics. I like philosophy. I like psychology. I like all of these things. And I want to have a topic. I want to comment on everything, but by making a video about tons of videos, about everything, YouTube's algorithm just doesn't push that out. So what I'm thinking is not necessarily about what I'm covering, but how I'm going to cover it. So there's going to be three main shows that I'm going to do moving from this moment forward. One of them is going to be the live stream. And the live stream is going to be me just reacting to things. It's going to be me interacting with things first time around. Uh, me researching things. Me having conversations with you, the viewers, and with my pals from the Discord or my friends in real life, like I'm going to have with Perry in a few seconds or Brett if he wants to come in and join. This is the things that, that I'm going to do when it comes to live streaming. When it comes to videos, I'm going to focus primarily on two types of videos. One of the videos that I'm going to focus on will be more akin to shorts, which will be little philosophy bites where I introduce a story or an example and tie it in with a philosophical com uh, a concept. And the other one will be maybe a little longer where I take a perspective because you know me, I love my perspectivism and I try to distill that perspective in almost like a story, whether it be my perspective on why I'm an atheist, whether it be the perspective on why I think the specific policy should go through. But the main thing around each one of these is that I'm going to be trying to tell a story who, what, when, where, why. And by pushing that story forward, hopefully I'll be able to either communicate it better with you, those who are already viewing, and those who are have yet to be, you know, viewed and as it's such. So that's like a, a thing that I'm really uh, reconsidering. Specifically, is how I'm going to go about working the channel. That, that's something I wanted to say. The other thing we're going to talk about right now, and Pear, you can jump on whenever you want at this point, is why, how liberals make conservatives is specifically like what I'm trying to tackle. Uh, I recently, while preparing for this live stream, I, I, you know, that guy who used to like made the song, um, Richmond, North of Richmond. Do you know who I'm talking about? Perry? Have you heard him before? No, nope. no. Okay. So let's, let's play that video. Let's play that video. Get a uh, Perry a little bit up to date. Let's, let me get that open. Sorry, it's taking a while. But how's your day been, Perry, other than that? Oh, exhausting. Good, but exhausting. Well, exhausting is good, right? Yeah, helps me sleep at night. Mm -hmm. um, Do you remember when, did were you there when I did that, like, reaction to the... Republican debate live stream thing? Or were you not there for that? I was there. I was there and you were talking with... You were discussing it with... Weren't you talking with somebody with it? And that, that wasn't me? I don't remember. Yeah, I think... I don't remember who it was specifically, but... Oh, you're, yeah, yeah. You were, it was a Sunday. It was a Rumble one, wasn't it? And you were talking about it with it John. Was, yeah, it was a Rumble. Yeah, I was talking with John. Yes, precisely. Here, so this is the the scene that I'm talking about. You can find, set it up, Perry. Okay. Let's do this. Hmm, why is it not giving me like a whole full screen? I don't know. Let's double see. double click. You had it for a sec. Yeah. Let me remove the scene and add it back in. I okay. apologize. Okay. 
Big Face Perry. Now it's still bugging. Why is it doing that? That's frustrating. You're double clicking full screen in it, right? Yeah, of course. Hmm. I'm going to reload the page. There we go. I've been selling my soul, working hard. All- so for those who don't know, this individual got really popular to the point where he was put on. I don't know why it does that. Whatever. Really popular to the point where this song was played at the Republicans' primary first debate. Um, and we're getting somewhere. So, so let's listen. To it. Okay. Well, I've been selling my soul. Working all day, overtime hours, for bullshit pay, so I can sit out here and waste my life away, drag back home and drown my troubles away, it's a damn shame, what the world's gotten to, for people like me, people like you, wish I could just wake up, and it not be true, but it is. Just miners on an island somewhere Lord, we got folks in the street Ain't got nothing to eat And the whole beast milk and welfare well, God, if you're five foot three And you're 300 pounds Taxes ought not to pay For your bags of fudge rounds Young men are putting themselves Six feet in the ground Cause all this damn country does Is keep on kicking them down So, do you see? Do you see any like parallels, Perry? Does this ring something to you, or is it just like some guy singing about politics? Uh, well, Marx comes to mind. So okay. It's like uh, it, the embodiment of Marx in the musical scene. Um, but I don't know. It seems kind of it seems pretty fucking based. But so a few things that I noticed from wh- what happened after this came out. First of all, the Republicans put him on the, the, the primary debates, and he's like, I don't like the Republicans. I want nothing to do with the Republicans. They're not they're the Richmond, north of Richmond. These are the guys who don't care about us. This is the swamp, basically. But at the same time, he's also talking about minors. He's talking about Epstein. He's talking about welfare people. If you're short and you're fat, you know, tax are being paid towards you. You're pretty much dead. You're six you're pretty, feet under. You're six feet under, and you know. That's kind of direction it goes to. So at this moment, this is where I think a lot of liberals create conservatives. Because that's the next thing I see. The next thing I see showing up on my feed is that this guy is sharing a stage with Jordan Peterson. He's on his show being interviewed by him, by him, talk to him. And what they are specifically talking about in one of the shorts that I saw, a small snippet of it, I was trying to find it through the whole um, video, was, let me go exactly, find exactly which one it is. Here, this. Here's the short. Perfect. Oh, am I not sharing my screen anymore? Okay, let me share no. it up. Yeah, there we go. Here it is. And I think this, this highlights a specific issue. Right here. Say that I'm a fence sitter and that I need to have some sort of call to action. And I guess like if there's anything that I would respond to that with, um, given the opportunity we have now, it's like, I think we need to take a step back and re-envision what we want the next 20 or 30 years to look like. And there's an important verse that 
came to mind. A Pharisee asked Jesus, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Like as simple as that is, if we could just find a way to make those two commandments, even outside of religious boundaries, if we could learn to make that our priority and then base our differences below that, you know, like God is here, our love for each other here. And then below that is try to find a way to integrate our differences in a way that everyone can can live a better life. I've had people say that. Okay. So what am I talking about? Is it that you, can, you just can't talk to Jordan Peterson? No, of course you can talk to Jordan Peterson. The problem that we're, that we're seeing is that Jordan Peterson is willing to sit down with him. Is willing to discuss the ideas with him because he didn't, because even if he says something edgy or wrong or politically harmful, they would, they're going to, they're going to immediately, that's one of our guys. We're sitting down with him. The way the Republican primary did, that's one of our guys. We're going to sit down with him. We're going to understand him. We're going to let him talk his Jesus talk and his Bible talk, which is very attractive to evangelicals. It's very attractive to the right. So what are, what's happening here is I, I'm I'm not going to be surprised that if within a year we're going to see the same individual repeating and being a part of the Republican and conservative machine. This doesn't exist on the left. It doesn't exist for liberals. Very seldomly do you find um, these like pop culture people being brought down and spoken to like let's just have a conversation with like a left wing media personality or something like that mm -hmm. you, you just don't see it as much you don't see that like like he said oh reach out your hand love your neighbor they feel unloved they feel unseen they feel not wanted not interested like they're just like these guys that now people don't want anything to do with because they either misrepresented them or you know a lot of times people will say things without really recognizing the implications of what it is they're saying or how it sounds publicly and I think that's how liberals make conservatives by pushing them into like a political type of marginalization, um, not in a negative way. It's not like done maliciously, but it's almost like, oh, we're not. That's a problem. You're problematic. People don't like you. What you have to say isn't fair. It's not right. And that automatically turns someone off and forces them in the other direction. Because you said what he was talking about sounds very Marxist, right? Sounds um, pretty based, yeah. But for some reason, the attention that he got was on the right. Well, so there's a couple of things. There's a couple of reasons that I could think of as to why that's the case. One is the, the phenomenon that you were talking about, where most of the time it's just like the right kind of vacuums up these kind of attractive, big hit, you know, uh, upcoming whatever he mentioned the two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he said that we ought do this, you know, not only in a religious context, which I don't really understand. How is it that you're going to love God outside of a religious context anyway? Um, <laughs> but that is probably the reason or one of the reasons I would think that he was, Unless, I mean, I don't know. He, unless, did he say, we didn't listen to the whole song. Did he say at the end of the song something about Jesus or God? I don't, or I don't think he did. From what I remember, I don't think he did. Because I, I would perhaps make a guess that JP knew that this guy was a Jesus freak and kind of latched onto him for kind of that reason. Um, we all know JP and he, as he is a Jesus freak as well. Mm -hmm. Um but it isn't something, I don't know, I wouldn't, I, I didn't expect that. It seems like it's two different personas that I just saw out of the same guy, to be completely honest with you. Kind of the more okay. lefty, I mean, it is kind of a lefty take for the most part, I would argue, what he was singing in his song. And then he goes to Jesus and talking about commandments and shit. So I, I don't know, that was... Uh, and I don't know if that's because he was talking to JP. Was he talking to JP there in that clip? Yeah, he was talking yeah. to J Jordan Peterson. In that so clip. I maybe he was doing it for the sake of being with on the show with JP. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think he's probably a religious guy, which is why. I mean, 
we have we have to recognize that Jordan Peterson is no longer a public facing intellectual. He is a arm of the conservative media of North America. That's mm-hmm. what he is. He's just one of those people. Um, Joe Rogan is not a, a, an arm of the conservative media. He's just the guy who has these conversations. But Jordan Peterson is for sure just an arm of conservative media at this point. Everything he spouses, those he supports, those he talks about is, is right-wing media. So the question comes, in the same way that right-wing media, right away when Kanye started wearing the Trump hat and was blabbering on his like crazy manic issues, they were right away willing to snatch him up and talk with him and, and be with him. and. Well, he had fascist traditional tendencies, right? He, he seemed to be like a superiority guy which is most of the time I would say a right wing type thing. So, but it's uh, other than just ideology, it's like that mechanism where it's like, Oh, we were having ish. Let's just bring you under our wing. Now that you are in the limelight, we're going to, we're going to bring you up right away. Yeah. Yeah. What you said, let's interpret it in the way that makes the most sense for us as opposed to actually hearing what you have. For example, um, What's, what's that guy who shot those people at, during the BLM riots? Uh, Martin or Written House. Written House. He Rittenhouse. went on. He went on Tucker Carlson. They set him up with money. They set him up to go into. He became something that the conservative right uses to push its ideology. I don't see the same thing existing on the left. I don't see the same thing existing in. Correct liberal circles it just doesn't it seems more like oh no stay the fuck out you're outside of our circle now you don't get into it you're toxic you're wrong what what i'm this is what i kind of see with kanye and then this guy do you think that when these conservative pundits take them up under their wings so to speak it's because they already have sort of right-leaning ideas because what's what's the what's the one what's the person who was on the Bud Light cans that the oh right Dylan wing, Mulvaney right so the right wing even though a popular person like that is never gonna take someone like that up under their wing Dylan Mulvaney has yeah probably... Dylan Mulvaney became the butt of a joke but this guy the, you when he first came out and said oh all those you know the Santis is not who I'm talking about that's like that could have been materialized upon. That could have been a way to appeal to th- voices that are not necessarily within the mainstream of liberal thought or whatever, and kind of push them over a little bit. Okay. Uh-oh. Does that make sense? It's okay. Oh. I'm still here. It's just okay. my camera doing its okay. weird thing again that it does. It's going to turn on soon. And I feel like that's missing from the left it's missing from the democratic establishment doesn't just doesn't seem to be there that same type of mechanism to just like uh, caitlin jenner that's scott's a good one caitlin jenner also a good one right a trans person who supported trump and became completely Mm. welcomed interesting right interesting so okay fair enough but like like the governor like i think the governor of new jersey has a it's embroiled in some like corruption cases automatically step down. We don't want you. Um, I think a few years ago, what was his name? A lot of Democrats liked him. Um, Oh, I forgot what his name was. He was a politician who grabbed some ladies, had a picture of him, like grabbing a girl's boobs on like an airplane or something. (laughs) Sure. Sure. It wasn't Trump. (laughs) No, it wasn't Trump. It was some other guy. And they're like, no, they, they removed him from the seats. Like no one, no one talked about him again. Hmm. And I feel like that is, part and parcel of a mechanism that doesn't exist on the left. Just, they just, it just doesn't exist there. Al Franken, Rogers. Al Franklin. Does. Yes. Al Franken, Rogers, right. Al Franken. So the right is really good at picking up strays. Anthony Weiner. Yeah. The right is really good at picking up strays and the left just doesn't do that. This, they don't have the established to do that. I just found it really interesting seeing this guy now on Jordan Peterson talking about, okay. So let's let's try and falsify this. Let's try and falsify it. Okay. I love referring back to Ad Fontes and the graph of mm-hmm. different, you know, there's people on the left, there's companies on the left, and there's people on the right. The Young Turks will take, for example, 
Yeah. Did, have they had anyone who they've, so to speak, taken up under their wing, who they've brought on board? I mean, I know Sam Harris came on for a disagreement that they were having together, not necessarily an Correct. agreement. Correct. Um, but do they do that with anyone where they bring up some... I don't know. I don't know. Does anybody know? Because that would be, you know, the way that JP brought this guy up, the singer whatever you want to call them. The way the, the, the Republican primary, the, the debates they put him on stage, the way Fox News talked about him, the way every single pundit spoke about him in turn and supported him. Um, is that, is so let's take the context of the song real quick. And yeah, you guys, if you have any uh, ideas of the left media groups kind of bringing up people, um, so his song, it seems like his song was leaning left. No? I mean, that's what you heard. A lot of people heard it lean right because he's talking about minors and Jeffrey Epstein, which was like a right-wing talking point. That like Democrats are like very qanon He's talking about people on welfare who are 5'3 and fat. Um, mm. That we care about minors, but not just minors on an island somewhere, right? So what minors is he talking about? They were talking about trans youth. Right now, you could hear, oh, yeah, we should care about minors and give them the proper health care that we need. That could have been a narrative that people on the left could have used, at least in like online spaces or communications, which just, I just didn't see. Oh, Brett, do you do you want to come in as well, Brett? Come into the conversation. Yeah, yeah, jump in. What's up, Brett? For everyone, this is Brett. He's uh, love talking with him. He's here. He's also from the Pangburn chat, and uh, we're just chilling and hanging out tonight. How hey, doing, guys. Can you, hear, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Brett, do you have any uh, thoughts on this whole the singer dude and the messages that he's sending and him being on JP's podcast or whatever? Uh, I'm not. I've been working pretty crazy lately, so I'm not caught up to speed on no worries. What it, what it is, what the scenario is. Well, well, let's just keep... This This is just my little analysis. I recently yeah, you. saw, you know, this guy who sang Richmond, North of Richmond, who was like, da na 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 He kind of sung this, this little uh, tune that was then played at the Republican primary. Or do you remember this? Uh, no, I don't. But yeah, keep, keep going, obviously. Okay, so <laughs> he was very much like lauded for by the conser- conservative media. He became like their, their singer. This guy who's talking about welfare people he's talking about minors on an island with epstein he's upset about the rich men who live in washington dc the the elites and he was kind of used as a as a prop during the republican primary after he was on that he released a video saying i don't i don't want to be have anything to do with republicans DeSantis is that rich guy like these are all those types of rich folks but what mm-hmm. happened I, I kind of stayed away from it and then i saw a short of him on Jordan Peterson's show. And I was like, hmm, interesting. Why is Jordan Peterson having this guy on? And they start talking about God and they start talking about uh, Jesus and loving your neighbor and these are you fix these solutions. And they have like its whole two hour podcast where they talk about Republicans and Democrats and the Bible and him being like used as a prop and, and being ousted and pushed away from the left. And it kind of made me think of all these other scenarios that I, I recognize in the last couple of years where the right is really good at picking up strays <laughs> and pushing them down the narrative that we are here not to censor you. We are here to let your voice be heard. We are here to support you where the left doesn't seem to do that in the same way with these like hot button, like um, one hit wonders type of media sensational people that the right does. Like they did, you know, they did it with him. They did it with other different singers or, uh, like when Kanye went all MAGA, they just like, yeah, 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 Kanye's MAGA, 100%. We're totally for it. But I don't see the equivalent on the left. And we're kind of just discussing if there exists an equivalent on the left. Like of being able to pick up a person for their like political side. Yeah. Yeah. And like then kind of mold them rising. into that and make them a spokesperson for them. In the Especially same someone who's rising in popularity, like Kyle Rittenhouse or this guy that we're talking about. Um you know, for the view, right? As someone who's going to get a lot of views and whatnot. The left is also picking up strays, just le- just less popular. Exactly, right? It, less attractive, less 
the views and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a political realist system out there and you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do to, to stay on top. Big dog, big fish eat little fish, right? Um, what are your thoughts? Kanye. Right. I needed, guess you're thinking there. Kanye. I, needed, yeah, yeah I, I guess I wonder, you know, why either side of the political spectrum picks up the given person. Um, yeah, what they're used for, if it's just for the, you know, 24 to 72 hour news cycle to, you know, get some points for the team, if you will. Um, and I think at least in the last couple of years, one of the challenges that the left has faced is, you know, I don't want to say that there's always an ev evangelical underlying idea with the right, but there is something that lies under there, whether it's about, you know, thinking it cool to always say that government just sucks and it does nothing. And, you know, you're taxed out of the wazoo, you know, just these points that you see come up time and time again. Um, but I think the left, at least in the last decade has really has been has been struggling to you know find a unifying voice um in part because you know it's it, it may not have the quote unquote like the um violent extremism that the right might see as much even though you see like protests and stuff that go out of line but the left is you know struggling to find a a, a unified vision and i i don't know if that's part of the you know discussion of like maybe. colonialism yeah go ahead no keep going i'm just saying maybe keep going yeah the, the discussion of colonialism the discussion of crt like all these other topics that have come up in recent the years which are considered left even though i think some of them at times are not left they're you know way left or you know wherever they might be on the spectrum but they're they're having a very difficult time unifying under something you know um yeah i'm not sure And, and and I think about that lack of unification, and it, it's interesting because in, in the short that he said he quoted, which one was treat your your love your neighbor right like yourself. That's what he kind of said, um, Perry, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah the 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 first two commandments right, love God the most out of anything, and then love thy neighbor as uh, as yourself right, the categorical imperative. Yeah, I think that what is interesting there the rights policy does not embody to love your neighbor like yourself not even close right they want to cancel welfare programs they want to lower funding for the department of education you want to close the border not let immigrants in take not make sure we don't have universal health care like kind of like a dog eats dog fuck your neighbor it, exactly, that's what i'm saying that's why i said in the beginning it sounded very marxian it sounded very left it sounded like he was complaining about the rich wanting total power right that's not the categorical imperative. That's right. So, and this is why I'm confused know. as but, to why. But I, it could be that the, the what at least people who are on the right feel and are feel disaffected by is this type of like social outcasting. Like, oh, treat me like your neighbor, love me like your neighbor. Well, they're not talking about policy. They just want to feel like they're being included, mm -hmm. like they're not being ousted. Maybe that's where that's coming from. The difference of seemings versus reality. Yes. It yeah. seems like I'm being loved, but in reality, you're getting fucked royally by the people in charge. Well, I think I think that that's a message which anyone who doesn't see that that could be a unifying factor for the working class on both sides um, wants to say that this is always like a difference that will never be crossed, you know, kind of like race lines and whatnot. Um, the fact that, you know. You don't want to just say that it's class warfare, right? But the fact that most Congress people are near millionaires just goes to show that many of them, even if they were coming from certain families where they, um, you know, made lower wages, like in the last, you know, 20, 30 years of their life, and then all of a sudden they rose to fame, like they're, they're very often out of touch with what the average person needs. And while the right claims to speak for the working class, they're still very you know, um, still very like, oh, yeah, but the job shipped to the other country. So that's just capitalism. So you're just not trying hard enough. So it's a very dichotomous like message that they send where it's like, yeah, individual work hard, bootstraps, all this other stuff. But they're not, 
you know, the, the followers are saying, yeah, but wait a minute, I'm supporting you because I, you know, I want that and I believe in that and I'm America and all this, you know, like patriotism followed by it. But they're also like, yeah, but all of my jobs just went to China for the car industry and, in, you know, in the in the in the 90s or, you know, the 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 systems that we normally had before have totally changed to where, you know, robots are now going to start basically taking everyone's jobs. And so. I don't know, I, I've always Let me ask been... you something, Brett, and sure. and and or Don Don, because when you were talking about unifying, right? has since the days of like Locke, right? Like the 18th century, have things gotten more liberal or more conservative? They've gotten more liberal, surely. It depends right? on, 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 on your center point and what you mean by conservative and liberal. Right. Cause you can see that like after the founding of the United States, for example, and I don't know if you call this liberal or conservative, it's up to you to define this, but I Brett, our history resident historian, amateur historian will will tell us that after the 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 founding of the nation there was a movement called the great reawakening and in this movement people in the united states felt that the founding of this country was too secular was too liberal and there's a whole movement that reinstantiated religion into the nation this happened twice mm -hmm. it happened right after the founding and then it happened as well in the 40s and 50s if i'm not mistaken um, yeah, perhaps you, it's fluctuated. Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And you could also argue that something like the war on drugs was kind of like a, a holy war from the right, believing that that would, you know, solve the moral crisis of the 50s and 60s that the right was so angry about with, you know, things like women demanding equality. I know that's like an outrage, um, but like <laughs> it's just like it's just like, no, there's been this there's a religiosity more so on the right that has been very fervent than on the left side. I mean, look at Reagan in the eighties, right. Um, with, uh, his emphasis, um, on the you satanic know, panic. Exactly. And stuff like that. And the bootstraps and, you know, all of these other comments where it's like trying to assert this, you know, right versus wrong. Half of it's economics, half of it's spiritual. There's some other, you know, um, smaller subtopics thrown in there. Okay. But it's just like, I think the point I was going for with the unification is like, if someone is, if someone is not doing well, like in like, for example, the automotive industry, like with the strikers right now, you, you all heard about that with the, um, yeah. Was that UW, UAW or something like that? Uh, I, Union, United of, Auto yeah, Union of Auto, yeah. UAW. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like automotive workers. Yeah. So like, any person who's working for them and is part of the union understands at a fundamental level that this is that that's an economic issue. That's not a partisan issue. Right. But the problem is, and this is the left and the right are both guilty of this. They don't I don't think they really want to acknowledge that because then they realize, oh, my conservative neighbor, my liberal neighbor, I'm supposed to not like you because you Trump, Biden, all this stuff. It's like, no, dude, the, the economic system is screwing you over. That's well, that's non-political. Economic. economic. Hmm. But aren't the solutions political? Could they involve a political mechanism? Don't they derive from politics? Or, or how are they not overlapping? I'm confused how these are non-overlapping. They issues. they might be overlapping. I'm not trying to uh, give a definitive objective yes or no. You know what I mean? But like the fact that yes and Don Don, the solutions might be political of like, does the government step in, free market, that kind of thing. But fundamentally, mm. the fact that the workers could not agree, like they could agree at someone in this situation, that's why there was a strike, right? But across the country, with, you know, many polls taken on wanting of some kind of universal health care, like, you know, Bernie was pushing for a while, um, with um, affordable housing, that should never be a controversial thing, you know, and if people are don't own their own home and they're spouting the thing of like, well, you just don't work hard enough. It's like you've been brainwashed by the system that, again, you're not bootstrapping it enough, which is just absurd. I, I want to share this TikTok, but I won't be able to find it in time. It was like these like 400 foot square foot, like not even houses for a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> yeah. like these sheds. Yeah. Uh, sure. And I'm just like, holy. And so, you know, I mean. But wouldn't you say that these issues like the UAW 
are deriving from some policies that enabled the bourgeois or whoever made it as so to allow this to happen, to allow this kind of inequity to happen? Didn't this come from some policy that has been established in the political or government or a lack system. of policy or just or a lack, lack of, po- yeah. or, or, lack or, of policy. or lack it could be of either policy. it could be either i okay. i don't want to speak yeah. too much on topics that i don't i don't want to go too far on what sure. i you know what might be speculative but i do know a good amount about u- union history and the the fundamental point that i ask a person if they say that they lean more right of center and they generally speaking that's where a lot of the um the the loudest voices are coming for like anti-union teachers unions ruining the country that kind of rhetoric which is just absurd but um it's it's this i it's i think it's this false education of not understanding why the unions were necessary and why today like you can have people of different political backgrounds in the same union at a job because fundamentally like if you don't understand that our economic system is happily willing to exploit send jobs overseas, bring in robot robots to do jobs that can replace humans. And, you know, that that kind of area of discussion, then you're I don't think you have a good grasp on, you know, the fact that it's not just a simple phrase of like, make America great again, um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, like, you know, the rights talking points that basically say like, this is your fault for being in the scenario you are. Admittedly, individual responsibility and choices do play a factor, but there's like this sense of righteousness at time. And I I see it on the left as well, but it doesn't coincide with, you know, the reality of our economic system that, you know, the most wealth goes to those who are the wealthiest, Um, you know, just like podcast streaming and whatnot goes to like the top 10 percent mostly. Um And we look at that and we're like, oh, so it's not really a meritocracy. It's like, well, it is in part, but it also, you know, like where what zip code you you grow up in, what education you receive is is a huge deal, you know, Mm -hmm. of of what you're going to be, what options you're going to be able to have in the years later. I think this will be really apropos to what you were saying, because education, where you are, America as a whole has been very much programmed to not like unionization, to not like yeah. um, anything that reeks of... Co- and, and this is was done by specific propaganda that was pushed in the 40s, 50s, yeah. uh, six, even through Reagan. It was to be called yeah. a communist yeah. was was worse than... You know, want to talk about cancel culture. Right. Yeah. It was literally a committee on un-American activities that if you were a communist... You'd be ousted out of every <laughs> professional circle, right? It was in Congress, yeah. people would have. So this is a short film called How to Spot a Communist, which was funded by a specific government uh, institution. I thought it would be pretty apropos to watch right now. So let's put that up. Therefore, propaganda is vastly more important in democratic societies. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person supports organizations which reflect communist teachings or organizations labeled communist by the Department of Justice, she may be a communist. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. If a person does all these things over a period of time, he must be a communist. But there are other communists who don't show their real faces, who work more silently. By the early 19th, so I thought that would be quick and nice. And uh, I kind of wanted to watch more of that, but oh, I can try to find the rest of it if you're interested. Well, let's talk about that. Well, I mean, what did you want to? Uh, how how was it that you thought it would be apropos to what Brett was saying? Because why is it looking like that? Hmm. Yeah, go. your face is on the fourth corner up there. there we, we fixed go. it. We fixed yeah. it. We fixed it. Perfect. So. 
Because I think what's apropos because Brett's talking about like education. He's talking about uh, generations and the, and the way people feel towards unionization. It, it was a real uh, propaganda effort, not like conspiracy. We have the receipts for it of the 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 ad. I think it's I think it was called the ad company or something like that that worked t- in tandem with the United States government to release. Films like Make Mine Freedom, How to Spot a Communist, that were just put out for people to watch. They were screened, they were paid for, for free, so people can go and watch these films. They were shown in schools and cartoons for children to really make people hate anything that has to do with unionization. Um, and, and, and that's a big part of it, right? Brett is saying these things aren't political, but they were made to be extremely political, like in, like in a partisan way, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, and just look at the the pathos used in that video right there on how you're talking about people using free speech, no evidence of what, you know, trying to overthrow the government, um, overthrow the government or do un-American activities saying, oh, they're un-American. Un-American American is free speech. American is using that free speech to look at the society and to critique what is going on Um with within that given society um give me one sec i gotta i gotta pause here go ahead and what do you what do you think about that well um i thought it was funny that they were kind of it's like how to spot like a predator like a child rapist but they were doing (laughs) it with like communism as if those things were like synonymous in some way uh or even similar yeah they're not so it was very dangerous to call yourself a communist what if you called yourself a Marxist? I mean, that's just a fancy way of saying that you're a interchange, communist. Interchange, interchangeable, interchangeable to a certain degree. Yeah. Or a socialist or pro-union. Yeah. Right? But you see yeah. the same thing today. If you, you hear, oh, those communist leftists are socialist pro-union Bidenites. Right? That's it's it's the same language. It hasn't really changed. Humanity is just so silly. Like if I during that time, if I said, Oh yeah, you know, the, these guys, the boss, he just watches all of us slave and go to work. But he gets all the money, man. This is this sucks. This is so unfair. Communists, get them, boys. You know, yeah, like exactly. Fucks, like humanity is so fucking. And and the thing is, during the 30s, right in the Great Depression, like they had real reason. They had real reason to see, like, hey, like the system has failed with you know with the stock market crash and whatnot. And, you know, 25 to 30 percent of people living in poverty or whatever the exact you know number was. Um, and yet again, the propaganda ma- machine comes back like it does with World War II. You know, as soon as um, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed by Japan, you know, it was like, OK, get into the war and whatnot. And by the way, I think that if you look at World War II, our intervention in it, that was completely necessary. Obviously, what was happen- happening to the Jews of Europe. Japan, et cetera, Germany needed to be stopped. But the bigger picture again, right, is the general use of propaganda, not just in war and political efforts, but then also for all the other efforts. You, for the longest time in U- United States society, would be ostracized to the point of the woods if you were anything but Christian in the given area, <laughs> right? If you were another religion, you would have to go join your own little neighborhood. Because in the 50s and 60s and, you know, time right after World War II, where they say, oh, America's doing great, all this growth. Yeah, there's still racial segregation. And the groups that fought that, um, uh, the groups that fought that um, really were having a hard time dealing with the, the norms of the given society, right? White, you know, people are going to be separated by race. People of a different religion are not as moral if you're a communist, you don't believe in the ideals of the United States, like those kind of things. And a lot of the time, communism, it's just a side thing, like communism was attributed to atheism and capitalism was attributed to religion and theism. Yet it seems no, like... No, no, com- communism is atheistic. That's what I said. And okay, that capitalism bad. is more th- is more theistic, okay, okay, but I always found that ironic because I feel like communism is more of a Christian type ideal, helping others, etc. And capitalism is more of the atheistic, there are no morals, big fish eat little fish type thing. I always found that ironic that 
most of the times they were attributed to yeah well american conservatives consistently have to contend with the note with the fact that their god was pretty much a socialist right like jesus was a socialist 100 percent. me and vlad had a whole argument over this and you know he jp'd his way around it of course but yeah who, who, I, who was that sorry i missed it old Colin days me and old... you, you know you remember vlad yeah, but what was the point that you were making about socialists or who? Uh, I, I, so I, 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 I was arguing that Jesus was a socialist, um, you know, giving everyone fish, giving everyone bread, curing everyone. He also he literally told, said... told the rich man to sell all your belongings and follow me, yeah. which was, I think, my main thrust of the argument. He also um, said, "A rich, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven." Yeah, but like that that's, is that's got to be. Like, I mean, how, how, how do you go? How do you how do you get past that? Yeah. The the yeah. the puritanical, if if help me out with the word and maybe look that up on Google real quick, the the verb from puritan to puritanical, right? Version of Christianity coming to this country. I have I have a good friend who. His name's Mike. He graduated from Harvard Divinity School. Um, he was a science teacher um, at a high school I used to work at, or the high school I work at, um, <laughs> to be there with me. He, um, yeah, it's a contradiction of both degrees. I was just going to say it's an oxymoron, <laughs> Harvard but, Divinity but, School. No, but honestly, like... <laughs> but, but getting his, getting the two degrees that he did, like, guy was on another, guy's on another level. And he said, he was like, yeah, look at, look at the history of how the religion formed here in the United States and how Christianity to quote Alan Watts institutionalized guilt and just this whole thing of like, you know, Oh, the country's too liberal at the very beginning, like the great awakenings or the great revival, whatever the name was, like you were saying, Dan, Dan, um, this absurdity, Oh, Congress shall uh, make no uh, establishment of religion. That's just absurd. Wait. So you think religion should be in government? No, it should not be. And I, I, it, I'm sorry if that I went too many places there, but there's just this like this is what we see with a, a, a real hypo hypocrisy with a lot of organized religion today. It's just basically like, no, I want you to be what I am. I don't need to actually like we don't actually need to, you know, treat gay people with respect. We don't need to um, try to keep our religion out of government. Our religion says that we should we should convert everybody and that they need to be like us. Otherwise, they're going to hell. And so it's like well, they're not near, they're not near the mission of the actual religion. They're in this aggressive bootstrap Christianity that just is a really bad mixture because it's because it's hypocritical. And if many I may, ways. just real quick, Don Don. Uh, yeah, I I, I I I sympathize with that somewhat, uh, ironically, because I think that ethics, not religion, but ethics should be implemented in policy and government. Um but, you know, the, what did you call it? What did you just call it? The organized, like, super religious, dogmatic, I, don't, I forget what adjective you used it, what, with it, but those types of organized dogmatic religions don't use reason. And I think reason and ethics are both needed within government and policy. But just, uh, so in, in which case I sympathize that don't necessarily, you shouldn't necessarily separate religion and government. Um in some cases, if ethics is your religion in that case, but organized, unreasoned, dogmatic religion ought not be. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Sorry, yeah. period. That was addressed to Don Don. My, my, my apologies. Go ahead, Don Don. Was that addressed to me? I mean, I was just going to gonna add that we look at the, the, the founding of this country. The religious people who came over here were they said they escaped for religious freedom. Yeah. In the books and literature of Germany and Austria and England, and they said radical religious lunatics went somewhere where they can practice their radical forms of Christianity, where they can do their witch burnings, where they can force people to live by the means of the church, how they wanted them to. Like, that's how they view those who founded this country. And it, it it would it, to a certain degree it would explain why a lot of the other Western countries might have a Christian you know Peterson Judeo Christian ethos of some kind at the you know fundamental tenets of it but but the uh, United States is the main industrial country who is still like fighting this battle of like 
where does religion actually belong? I agree with you, Perry. The ethics of religion should be within the government so that like, you know, when we had kids dying of coal mine, you know, dust and whatnot and black lung disease, I'm pretty sure was what it was called. And the capitalists were like, eh, whatever. We're making money. We need them in there. And it wasn't until the social and labor movements that were much more liberal said, no, you can't do that. We're going to in fact, we're going to we're going to we're going to push society and and um, and strike enough and make a scene to where the politicians will have to change the laws. But that ethic should not like you. I think you alluded to should not be from the given organized religion itself from reason. Yes, exactly. I just had someone in my ear, a friend, send me a message. Rhode Island was founded by people fleeing Massachusetts for religious freedom. So (laughs) I think the irony, (laughs) I think what's funny about it is that when you think of like, oh, why is religion and state so separate in the United States government? Because that was the way we could get all these different religious groups who ran away to their own thing to unite together against King George. Yeah. And and if you don't, I don't ever I don't try to come off as condescending or patronizing. But if a person were to say to me. I don't agree. This was founded as a Christian nation. They're clearly not reading the First Amendment in the historical terms that the different people talked about it because they understood they had enough education and life experience to understand that the second that religion gets into organized government around the world in history, it doesn't play out well. No. Hutus and Tutsis, Rwanda, um, I, uh, Catholics and Protestants, Ireland. Um, just go down the list, right? It do- There is not a lot of good evidence that an organized religion can go mix with the government at, at certain levels and, and, and how it's going to treat everyone equally within that society. Now you might, someone might try to counter, Oh, well, England has Christianity with the church and the King and queen in there right now. It's like, yeah, but the King and queen have been put under check. They have almost no power. There's a parliamentary procedure where it's not a requirement to be a Christian to be in member a parliament of England or Great Britain. If it was, that would that would be an example of a problem. You know, why why did the northern why did the violence in Northern Ireland with the troubles pursue for so long? Because they because each one of them was blowing up blowing up each other's children saying you're worshiping the wrong Jesus. And and I think that's the problem with like uh right wingers like Jordan Peterson, the person you had on, very religious folk, instead of thinking Hmm. What policies that can affect real material shit, roads, money, jobs, yeah. can 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 change society? They go, no. The way to change society is if everyone acts in this way, which I believe is the best way to act. Yeah, and that is a completely that that is divorced from liberalism. That's why it's not liberal. I would also I would also I would also argue it's devoid of reality. Like yeah. if you haven't read um, Andrew Yang's The War on Normal People, I literally have it here on my desk. Um, he makes the amazing point that we're basically in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. And, you know, robots don't care what political party you are. You know, they don't care what um, what your economic theory is from Adam Smith, who could have never predicted robots coming in here you know, to this, to, to take over such automation. Um, even though he might've seen some in the very beginning, that's, that's another one too, which let's go back to both Locke and like Adam Smith and, you know, conservative or liberal thinkers of the past, you know, a couple hundred years, we have to update and modernize with thoughts and, and concepts that are related to the economics and the political situation of the given time period. And like I I was trying to allude to earlier, it's 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 just a very like the fact that both that the average person is being bamboozled by both parties right now to not get down to the common sense that you know jobs are many jobs are in danger of either not existing anymore of again like automation taking over largely but also then just the basic thing of like inflation of what can you know, how much you can buy with how much money you have these days. A lot of conservative areas will want to say, well, as soon as the town becomes liberal, then everything becomes ill afforded. It's like, no, that's not really a thing. What it is, is that the towns get bigger and they need more, 
you know, they become large cities and those they large infrastructure. Cities, yeah, exactly. But the problem is, is the, the it's problem. Also, though, it's also larger cities tend to become more educated and more educated people are generally more liberal. And see, so. and yeah, and see, I think that's definitely something we have to be cautious of because it's not necessarily the thing of education or whatnot, you know, to say like who has a better grasp on reality. But I do think that in the terms of like, you know, how we are, how we are tribalized into our political parties and we don't ad admit, you know, several truths that can exist at the same time. And also, you know, why is lobbying a thing? Why are, why are groups allowed to go into Congress and spend million, the tobacco industry obviously famously did this in the nineties. And I'm sure I haven't followed it in the recent decades, but I'm sure it does to a certain degree still today um, to not make, you know, tobacco fully illegal because of its harmful effects. Um, I don't know if I would say I would, if that would be a good thing, but like the point is that the ethics at times are not in the system, right? Correct. It, and, and housing is a perfect example. When someone says to me these days, when I, I cause I'm my fiance and I are at some point looking to, to buy in California, which might be just a laugh. Um, but, but like, um, unless we want to be in, you know, in the middle of nowhere where we, where we don't have any friends or family. Um, but it's a very, like, it's a very thing of like, oh, if you don't have a house, that's your problem. I'm like, I want to hear who's saying that. Yeah. When, they, when, they, when those guys bought, bought a house for $17,000. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or, HG brings up a well, good well, point. Working that, as like a, a coach at a high school. Yeah. Yeah, HG brought up a good point that Brett was talking about earlier that yeah. the economic, political, whatever policy is based on the the time period and location yep. of a yep. certain area. Even yep. philosophy like this, if you want to understand Socrates, you got to know Greek art, Greek culture, the time period, yep. the geography of it all. So you know, all of these things are. Uh, and with technology, especially right now, AI, all of this stuff, it's going to be extremely hard. I mean, we have so many problems, I feel like, at least economically, especially economically, to deal with before we can try and catch up to this rapid increase of technological advances that will surely play a role in, you know, in policies that are going to be formed later on in the next few decades. Well, a lot, a lot of what we're seeing from, you know, security stuff like that as well uh, the issues we see with technology is because there was a serious period of re deregulation in the 80s right it used to be that you couldn't advertise to children on television you were yes. not allowed to make advertisements for children exactly oh that was exactly. whose policy was reagan that? reagan that's right yeah, yeah. and right? they just and took, they just took the gloves off like you and you also weren't allowed to advertise for kids at a grocery store you weren't allowed to like make cereal boxes and now it's everywhere on social media yeah now was, it, just, was it also like, Reagan yeah. or JFK that made it that you had to do 13 pull-ups for your president? I think it was JFK, actually. You had to do what? 13 you had to do 13. That was your presidential fitness requirement, which nowadays ain't no way. Ain't no way 3% of kids are going to be able to do 13 pull-ups. Or, yeah, it was pull-ups. And then like, Oh, you mean like a presidential up. award? Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're physical. Okay. Like physical. And, and I'm saying fitness nowadays, fitness us yeah. fat fucks are not, you know, we can't, we can't do that, right? Everyone's fat because probably of advertising for sugary cereal to kids. Well, and, dude, yeah, the whole know. psychology of, of Tony the Tiger, like the faces look down at kids to make them feel trustworthy. And like there's a whole, there's a whole message on that. Also because grocery store, look, there's personal choice. People may make good decisions when you realize that you've become addicted to sugar and other things, right? You have to do, do you do have to take some personal responsibility to make lifestyle choices. We can admit that, right? At the same time, something else can be true as well. When you go into the modern supermarket, how is it set up? Everything in the middle is the most is the best selling products. And usually, what gets front space at the as you walk in? When I walk in Walmart, it's it's produce for me. So, really, but, yeah, yeah. For us from here in New York, it's also produce at first. It's not. It's not Doritos Fourth of July no, hot dogs. That's like the third to last aisle. Yeah. All the sugary. Huh. 
Because they want you to walk through everything to get there. To get where? That, oh, that, the best selling oh, product. That's a good point, Don Don. They want them to see everything else so that there's more of an, you know, if you're going in to get chips, you're going to go get chips, right? There's not going to be much that stops you. So while you're at it, why don't we advertise all of this other stuff that you have to walk by and maybe you'll grab some of this, a little bit of that, maybe a little bit of this, and it increases your your the price that you're going to pay at the grocery yeah. store. What's the, hold on, what grocery store chain Let's let's try to do a comparison here because I'm a little I'm a little baffled by by this realization from you guys. <laughs> what? No, really, like because sure, I see sure. something totally different here on the West Coast. What um, what what grocery what grocery store chain do you guys go to? Walmart and Publix. For me, I stop at King Cullen, Stop and Shop mainly, and then even kosher grocery stores are also produce first. Okay, what about Maybe, you? Yeah, maybe mine. Mine's Safeway, which is a fairly generic brand. I don't know if it's national. Um, Lucky will be another one as well. Maybe it's not. Maybe it isn't all grocery stores. Maybe it just depends on region or you know maybe. things that they're selling. I but, just, but but what we can say for sure is that sugar is more addict is is addicted like cocaine. Yeah, it lights kids, up the same parts of your brain. Yeah. With cocaine. Yeah. Kids get hooked on it. Listen, I struggle with an eating disorder. Do you know how 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 difficult it is? Just driving around and having this like instant fast food if I want it. I literally like w- drive yeah. by a fast food. And I just I go, I say, fuck you. I get so angry at it. It's like, why are you here? Why are you why are you in front of my face? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they also it, it also you know- a, a, another thing real quick is <laughs> when you go down the bread aisle in the United States, mm-hmm. all of those breads cannot be sold in Israel or Europe as bread. They do not they count as cake. Bread uh, in the United States is the equivalent to cake. It is next most to the cake in the bakery section, to be fair, though. Like, I mean, where else wild. are you going to put bread? Not next to cake, but it's not like it's not bread. It's not considered bread. It's not I mean, I'd put it next like to bread. like the rice and the pasta, just how I would, because I'm a very macro based person, but you know. No, but think I about it. The, the bread is subsidized as a staple food. Like, you bread, eggs, and milk. Like, they have like price caps and their the government helps to make sure that if something like wonder bread and like newman's honey oats cinnamon and maple syrup is a bread it gets treated financially as a bread and it's not it's a cake um so. huge huge main has a good uh uh quote in the comments need to teach to cook in school i 100 uh, percent you're gonna say that I, one well that's also true you yeah. know you gotta right how do we but like right advertising how does it psychologically get to us with like the 90s i don't know what you guys how old you guys are exactly but in the 90s cereal commercials were huge they're still kind of big but in the 90s they were honey oats um golden grams like all of these smacks they were just everywhere right i'm 39 don don's 30 how old are you bro i'm i'm 38 so we're i'm even older than that part there but (laughs) but but you know you know another one, is Perry. The... You're not 39. Why are you pretending that you're 39, Perry? You're not yeah. 39. Close enough. Anyway, what no, were you take saying? 13 years down. No, he doesn't count. He sees. The, he saw the commercials in the early 2000s with Lucky Charms and Trust. Yeah, they're That's still the there. Thing. And well, also like the McDonald's with models <laughs> that are happy, right? When these models yeah. are not eating that food, but like no. To the guy's point in the chat, a uh, huge main. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. Um. The like proportions, you know, basic teaching of like, you know, when you go to get the bag of chips or whatever else it is, you know, there's a reason we eat like a lot of it. Right. But the problem is, is that when you really portion out what they say, like two thirds of a cup for like a couple hundred calories, you know what I mean? It's like it's It's like that. It's like that. Well, then again, we've been eating it for so long. Right. That we say, no, I really want like three cups. That's like something really tasty because I'm. I want something tasty and it's like, okay, but now you're eating 700 calories like that. What I advise for so. everyone is to get a free app. It's called Stupid Simple Macro Tracker. There's a couple of them. They're free. Just yeah, plug in. You know, you start becoming more cognizant of what you're eating. Yeah. You're not just eating a whole carton or package of something because you think that that's one serving when in reality it's like four and a half servings per carton or package, right? Yeah. Um, so and yeah dude uh uh i don't have i don't drink you know soda so i don't i don't have one if you look walk walk into the gas station get a 16 or 12 ounce thing of soda of coke Mm coca-cola yep 
it'll have over a hundred percent of your daily value of sugar in one serving. Yeah. Over that should be illegal to have over a hundred percent of anything. And you know what's wild? When you go to watch um, I don't know again our age differences and when you saw these commercials or whatnot. Coca-Cola's polar bear commercials, the mid 90s, they had these Christmas commercials that were just the best advertising I've ever seen. It's just like they Those took Stan- they took Stana, they took the modern not all. Remember Perry, we did this show a couple years ago with with um Christmas and winter holidays, but like they they take all of the images and their advertising is perfection. The music, the the feelings, the engagement. Um, you know, it's a 250, look it up to make sure I'm audience, make sure I'm right on the numbers. It's like $250 billion industry with the, with the Coke company. Conservatives would love world. that. They'd bring them under their wing and yeah. take those commercials because they're so popular. And they're just, I mean, hey, we, people freaked out when Starbucks took off the fucking Christmas trees off their cups. Yeah. So. But it's just very like, it's right. It's indicative of how advertising, like not to always quite quote flight club right but like advertising is buying is convincing people of buying stuff they don't need and hey with, with the drink- advertising 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 is to corporations what propaganda is to pol- is to governments there's no difference and it's just it's just trying to make you think uncritically how about you think product. how about you take a propaganda at these nuts and 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 scott <laughs> Wow, Perry. Scott and I, the other night, we were talking um, on Discord, and I brought up the Isaac, what's his name? Isaac Asman, Asmininoff? I don't right? know. That's Perry, isn't that the... I don't know. The, Scott, Scott will bring him up, though, surely. Yeah, next, Scott, bring him up in the chat, else. if you will. He's the guy who wrote that quote you might have seen circulating on the internet where it said, like, there's this culture of ignorance in the United States where, like, where it's become is, like, my ignorance is as good as your... as 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 moth. as moth yeah my ignorance is as good as your truth your facts and i want to be very clear on this that that is scoping out on both sides of the political spectrum that scopes out on where you get on to social media twitter other places now and facts and truth and discussions to try to reach an agreement on what it, reality is not like a metaphysical like the philosophical that we could go the road down road Right, Perry, but like oh, the basic, but, but the basic thing of like nutrition and and um, how you create a civil society where all rights of people need to be protected because I would argue part of the left's you know going crazy on their on the things with gender and stuff is really because of of decades of oppression to be killed, you know, and ostracized and be kept in the closet. Um, I think well, I think on, you're, yeah, I think you're ahead, drinking a bit of the the, the right wing propaganda on your news feeds. I think when we look when we look at political party versus political party and bills and actions and speakers they bring on and what is actually happening in legislators across this country, the Democratic Party brings in legitimate experts. Their policy seems to be based on scientific data much more than their counterparts. So I don't think it's even. I don't think it's even at all. I don't, I agree. I don't, I don't know what good it does for us to consistently point out who's smarter, who's better. It's I not think. about who's smarter, who's better. I think it's, again, it's one of those things where like, they're not applying the Christian values of uh, humility. Because, because of the propaganda, admittedly. Yeah. 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 Or the culture or cultural norms for decades of. You know, whatever it might, you know, might yeah. be. Where it's like, oh, I might, I just don't know about this. Let me appeal to an expert. Instead, you get, I oh no, got... these are corrupted institutions uh, from the, the the academia. For example, you know, when I had the conversation with John about how do we know what is child abuse, and instead of saying, well, we know it by we appeal to the scientists who study mental health and children and recognize we look at the psychologists to figure out that corporal punishment was child abuse but but now in, instead of saying yeah you're right that's what we do it's oh no but the academia is corrupted it's ideologically possessed right it's it's a way of of uh, of of saying that's demonic i'm righteous that's evil i'm holy 
my opinions are based in facts and logic and their opinions are based which, in which is wild because we know that with the construction of the idea of race and the 19th century beginning of eugenics and whatnot in the united states we know if you have read it and read the history on it then that that's the exact kind of bullshit excuse i hope i'm allowed to swear on here you're allowed to swear. i mean i just said take a propaganda at these nuts so i'm sure that you can say bullshit. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of bullshit that we now know that if you don't acknowledge how that was created and how it made, you know, superior, inferior arguments about races and how they're all completely delegitimized, if you don't know that history and understand that history, you you haven't read it and you need to understand it. But now, right, something seeped into where the association of feminism and whatever else it is from the 60s in the academia, it's like. It's like one drop of poison went into the entire well of academia and the one person who doesn't trust, you know, the certain part of academia now doesn't trust the entire thing and thinks that, you know, vaccines cause autism. I'm not saying it's always a correlation, but yeah, you're right. Like there's there's this weird like, hey, man, like just because you got hit as a child, that doesn't make it OK. And you can't hit your child. Right. Yeah, like, it's that same. It's that same pattern of like justifying the abuse justifying the way things are oh things are changing no i turned out fine because i was hit then it's okay like the institutions nah now we can hear you scott. oh we can hear scott oh scott's coming in hello scott only me Oh, he's talking. Don't worry. I, 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 I'm just going to turn off off stage feed so I can actually okay. see what's happening. Yeah. Um, where was I? The fact you're you are right. The fact that we cannot get on the same page about child abuse and don't even talk about microaggressions and how that could affect people's you know psychology and given workplaces and stuff. But just start with the basics of like hitting other human beings. Some people, it used to be normalized to say, well, it's just how you grow up and it's how you get mature and blah, 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 whatever. And it's like, yeah, there's a difference between or playing organized sports where you get your ass kicked because you're just not as good an, of an athlete or jujitsu or whatever. Right. And then there's the other side where it's like, no, like your your parents should not be hitting you. We used to think it was acceptable to keep kids in line. We now know all of the literature that should be trusted says, no, it's psychologically and physically. Uh, yes, so... yeah, one second, Scott. Uh, one one thousand percent, Brett, and I, and I feel like this the anti academic movement. It's not just we can't. It, it's almost like it it has come through the same like evangelical. We don't trust the scientists. We have our scientists. They have their scientists. It's almost like the 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 new atheist movement could not stop this part of the United States, which it happens to be the South and the Midwest. While they might have argued them out of Jesus, they didn't argue them out of conspiracy. They didn't argue uh, argue them out of their hyper-skepticism about everything except what they already believe. Yeah. In a way. And I, I just... The fact that there are certain topics that we can't sit down and have a sober conversation with people of different political spectrums on. I feel like it could be had, but people have to know or have to be trusting to go into those conversations to say, all right, we're going to see where the gift, the given ideologies, like we discuss the ideas that are brought forth. And if you have something counter, you don't just get to say, I don't like that because it conflicts with my, you know, my socio religio religio beliefs of existence. It's like, no, like you, you really need to, you need to bring in counter evidence for something. And it's one thing that you're, you're worried about the social aspects of society changing because of, it might conflict with what you believe about the social aspects. But it's another thing when you're, you're completely denying that, you know, um, Sex. Look at how look at how it used to be legal for a husband to beat his wife. Yeah, I mean, women couldn't own credit cards until the 1970s. Yeah, and they and the, the people, <laughs> like I don't understand when the I don't understand when a person will argue 
you know, the liberal hippie commies did everything wrong and then everything's been going wrong since the 60s. It's like, so you're cool with, so, so it's part of Make America Great, the segregation? Is part, of, is part of Make America Great Again the time Pretty period much. where... Pretty much. And 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 that, I actually had an argument. I don't, I don't know about an argument. I had a, a, dis, a disagreement with a, a guy. Heated a disagreement. Guy. Yeah, heated. where he was asking me, like, what is so wrong about Make America Great Again? And I said... Tell me what time period. And if you say the 1950s, you automatically lose the debate because of the racial segregation. It's a very white thing of you to say. Unless you have a crazy good argument for slavery, which I'm, I don't <laughs> think there is one. But I mean, I'm not going to say that there is. Well, we're, we're hitting the, the one hour and 30 minute mark. And I really wanted to go over this paper that someone sent to me. And I think mm-hmm. it, this okay. is exactly the right spot because this term, this paper deals and I haven't read it yet. So I want to just like get my live stream from this point on are going to be me going over things that I haven't heard before, having relaxed conversations with my my friends from Discord, my friends in real life, people from the chat. This is what this live streams are going to be from this point forward. Um, and they actually talk about objectivity. So let's let's kind of break out from the politics and talk about well. What is objective? How can we tell what is real in front of us? Well, I have uh, somewhat of an ick against this word because I hear it used. There's two main definitions, and I hear them being conflated all the time. One is things that are mind and or stance independent, things that exist independent of humans. If if all humans cease to exist, this would exist, right? A tree uh, assumingly exists if all humans cease to exist. Uh, independent of humans, of our minds. The other one, objective, is a goal or an aim, a telos, as said in Greek, a purpose, right? Like, what is the objective of the game of chess? Or what is the objective of uh, of us doing this mission, right? So, uh, the, and I hear these, especially with morality, uh, privilege. So I don't know what this is going to be talking about, but these are the two ways that I uh, know of. And... People equivocate these two homonyms quite often. I think they also equivocate not only my objective; they also um, uh, equivocate things that are not from the su- not like from the subject. For example, like the fact I'm holding someone and flipping it. It's an objective thing, and then they'll say, "Well, feelings are subjective, so they're not real." Because then they'll equivocate objective with that which is actually real, as opposed to that which is born of the subject or dependent on our mm, mind that's for another one reason. right yes. yeah I, subject versus object yeah, i ahead. would want to get clear on the definition of objective and i agree with don dunn in a sense that i you know you can tell me that i'm in the wrong category but something like gravity is not up for debate right you know gravity in 99.9 percent places on earth exists it's objectively real it's factually you can factually follow it and and make conclusions about it um i don't know if that relates to either your definitions pair or what we're going to read in here. Yeah, that's, you know, gravity is, is gravity as it's used as a universal law so that we could do uh, science and physics. It is also a theory. So I wouldn't say that gravity exists 100% certainty. I'd say 99.999999999, right? But enough that we can move forward with it with certainty that yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to go to the Grand Canyon and test whether or not gravity works by putting my body over the ledge to fall down a mile. And in my own terms, I call this lowercase o objective because we can't be 100% certain, but certain enough. Capital O would be those things that absolutely exist independent of our minds, which the paradox is we can't know, right? Because we have to use our minds to know these things, right? But we epistemologically agree. It's epistemologically objective that gravity exists. Now, I believe that it does exist. In the, like if I had to place a bet, right? If you had a gun to my head and you said, you got to pick one, does it or does it not? Ex- All right, you know, I'm going to say gravity exists, right? Um, but yes, with enough certainty, I, I would, I'd go, I'm fine with that. Right? Okay, so that's it. Now I'm forcing us to go ahead and read this paper because, hey, we got to channel our inner Thomas sometimes and try to figure out, well, what do we mean by objective? And okay. well, let's see. So this, this, this paper is written by Donna, Haraway, um, and I believe it's from 
some 1988 volume feminist studies philosophy stuff. So let's 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 go ahead and, and start reading. I'll start. Academic and activist feminist inquiry inquiry has repeatedly tried to come to terms with the question of what we might mean by the curious and inescapable term objectivity. We used to have a lot of toxic ink and trees processed into paper decrying what they have meant and how it hurts us. So I'm already thinking that it's talking from the perspective of a woman or a female to other females, if that makes sense. Okay. Right? Are we following this so far? Sure. The imagined they oh, constitute a kind of invisible conspiracy of masculinist scientists and philosophers replete with grants and laboratories. The imagined we are the embodied others who are not allowed who are not allowed not to have a body, a finite point of view, and so an inevitable disqualifying and polluting bias in any discussion of consequence outside our own little circles, where the mass subjugation journal might reach a few thousand readers composed mostly of science haters. That's that's a big sentence here. So what are what are we feeling about this one right here? There's some discrimination between the people in control, i.e. the scientists who have laboratories and grants uh, versus this kind of out group, we can call it, this kind of minority um, who are not allowed not to have a body, a finite point of view, and so inevitably disqualifying and polluting bias in any discussion of consequence outside our own little circles. We're a mass it's, it's, it's the who are not allowed to not to have a body. This statement rings out to me. For I, I, I'm feeling like think about it. It's, it should, this writer, what's her name again? Donna. She, she uh, is almost saying something along the lines of, "It's the, the the those who are presumed to know objectively what is real are acting as if they don't have a body, and us who are subjugated are." Are, are, are forced to, to be thought of as if we do have a body, that we yeah. have bias in everywhere we go, that we're infected by our subjectivity is almost like yeah. how she's talking about Well, it. she sounds like a romantic because I don't know how you can not have a body. Well, I guess it's just like a, almost like a, 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 a perspective or a stance that she's taking at the issue, right? Like When did she oh, write this? This is 1988. Is she... Do you, let me know if you think I'm off here and if you want to keep reading or whatnot, but is she kind of referring to the fact, not just with scientists, but also the, the, you know, the image of, of the sexes in the past couple hundred years where women were considered completely erratic and, you know, emotionally un unstable and men were the ones yeah. who, th it's the reason why we call it mankind. Or if you read any 19th century or 18th century literature, like there's always the reference to man. There's not a reference to woman because woman was not considered equal to man. Like, is, is this kind of where she's going, but she's talking I about think so. or am I on? Well, she's talking about, she's talking right now about them as fantasies that we are not allowed to have a body or there are these guys who are like not letting, you know, no, this is what she's talking about right now. Hmm. So, so she said, let's, let's continue. At least I confess to these paranoid fantasies and academic resentment lurking underneath some convoluted reflections in print under my name in the feminist literature in the history and philosophy of science. We, the feminists, in the debates about science technology, are the Reagan era's special interest groups in the rarefied realm of epistemology, where traditionally what can count as knowledge is policed by philosophers mm. codifying cognitive canon law. Interesting. I like that. I've, what do you think about it so far? Well, it's like there are certain philosophers gatekeeping certain epistemological axioms that are indubitable, right? Or they're, they're so certain that they can't be, uh, they can't be critiqued. And this is her trying to critique it. It's, uh, this is her beginning I of her trying to critique it I, I wonder if she's at all referencing you know the ayn rand fascination maybe that the fact maybe. that so many of her followers and you know either in during that time period or now more in modern times like you know 
don't like there's no there's just the individual there's there's nothing else i mean yeah maybe i want to copy this reagan era special interest what is, what is she referring to i was going to ask you that because you'd have a better idea of what exactly was going on during reagan era to perhaps get a glimpse of what she was trying to talk about there let's see the rise and fall of special interest group second no nope. oh yeah there it is there it is it says right here um let's, let's look at this in his farewell address of administrative officials president ronald reagan wanted americans against the power of special interest and iron triangles a triangle of institution, parts of Congress, the media, and special interest groups is transforming and placing out of focus our constitutional balance. Okay. So the idea that, you know, she's a part of this special interest group, they are the part that's like destroying legitimate power, legitimate authority in, in the, the meaningful way, if that makes sense. Oh, I like this full screen thing. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Respect my authority. Okay, who, who wants to read next? I do, I do, I do. Okay, we're right here, and of course. Of course. A special interest group is by... <laughs> what? She gives us a definition. By Reaganoid definition, any collective historical subject that dares to resist the stripped-down atomism of Star Wars, hypermarket, postmodern, media-simulated citizenship. Max Headroom doesn't have a body. Therefore... He alone sees everything in the great communicator's empire of the global network. No wonder Max gets to have naive sense of humor and a kind of happily regressive uh, pre oedipal sexuality, a sexuality that we ambivalently, with dangerous incorrectness, had imagined to be reserved for lifelong inmates of female and colonized bodies and maybe also white male computer hackers in solitary electronic confinement it has seemed to me that feminists have oh, both i think i think we have to talk about this because I, I lost myself a little bit here yeah these run on sentence sentences are not my style so um, so th there's a few here things that are really interesting so first of all i think when she said over here is where is it um of course max headroom doesn't have a body this seems to me like this comes from deleuze Right again, the idea of not having a, a a body, like, and therefore alone sees everything in the great. Com like when you don't have a body, you're unlimited in a way, and you can Unbonded. kind of see everything. Right, like you're a, a disembodied mind. You're no longer bound by that which like re physical reality constraints. Okay, but Max, is this a reference to something? Is, is she going to talk about that? No, I don't think. But I want to know what this is. I don't know who Max Hedrum is. Is this a character in some movie? It might be a character in some movie or some play. Okay. Um, and for those who are watching this and are like, is it, this, is, this is what you do when you study, read philosophy. You look up the things you don't know, right? Uh, yeah, he's a fictional character. Played um, from actor, yeah, advertised as the first computer-generated TV presenter. Okay. 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 Next, let's keep going. Uh. It has seemed to me that feminists have both selectively and flexibly used and been trapped by two poles of attempting dichotomy. Uh, is it a false dichotomy? Maybe. We'll find out. Don we'll Don knows. Out. I have no idea. I haven't read this. Of attempting dichotomy on the question of objectivity. Certainly I speak for myself here, and I offer the speculation that there is a collective discourse on these matters. Recent social studies of science and technology, for example, have made available a very strong social constructionist argument for all forms of knowledge claims, most certainly and especially scientific ones. It reeks of logical positivism. Yeah, it does. Where is it at the bottom? There's a. Where's it? It's on the other page? A little one? Where's the one? Oh, this is it. No. Well, there's some citation that we have to we'll find. Get there. According to these tempting views, no insider's perspective is privileged because all drawings of inside-outside boundaries in knowledge are theorized as power moves, not moves toward truth. Interesting. So we have power so from the and we have truth. Yeah, so from the social perspective, I think she's saying that 
these power dynamics aren't aimed at truth as we understand science, but rather they're aimed at power. Maintain, maintaining big fish, themselves. Big fish, right. yeah. Maintaining yeah. your social hierarchy, right? Yeah. So from the strong social constructivist perspective, why ought we be cowed by scientists' descriptions of their activity and accomplishments? They and their patrons, patrons have stakes in throwing sand in their eyes. They tell parables about objectivity and scientific method to students in the first years of their initiation. I'm starting to sympathize with this. I have had similar thoughts. But no practitioner of the high scientific arts would be caught dead acting on the textbook versions. Scroll down mm -hmm. a little bit so I can see. Um, practitioner. Social, con social, yeah. social constructionists make clear that official ideologies about objectivity and scientific method are particularly bad guides to scientific knowledge, to how scientific knowledge is actually made. That's just, true. Just as for the rest of us, what scientists believe or say they do and what they really do have a very loose fit. You want to talk about that or you want to keep going? I think it's pretty clear, Brett. Okay. It is. I agree. The only people who end up actually believing and got us for, <laughs> the feminist, God the feminist, yeah. the feminist, feminist. Say, <laughs> goddess forbid, acting on the ideological doctrines of disembodied scientific objectivity enshrined in elementary textbooks and techno science booster literature are non scientists, including a very few trusting philosophers. You know what's interesting? This was written in the 1980s, so it's coming right off the tail of like madness and civilization from Foucault, and these other like critiques of the way in which modern science has enshrined specific doctrines. I want to remind anyone who's watching this: we are 40 years removed from this. Science is a very different place now than it was then. I just want us to remember this. Another enemy of the Enlightenment, and I would argue that even today we are still in a Romantic period something we can talk about another time. But um, let's see. Of course, my... I think that's where I'm at. Of course, my designation of this last group is probably just a reflection of a residual disciplinary chauvinism acquired from identifying with historians of science and from spending too much time with a microscope in early adulthood in a kind of disciplinary pre and modernist po yeah, and modernist poetic moment uh, when cells seem to be cells and organisms, organisms, pos hmm. that's yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. In in a, in a modernist poetic moment, when yes. cells seem to be cells and organisms be organisms. So, for those who don't know, modernists and the modernist movement in general, philosophically and academically, could be understood as by by there is there's like mental illness and there's wellness. There's good and there's bad. There are cells and there are organisms. There is a mind. And there is a body, there is rationalism, there is empiricism, right? This was key things in the modernist movement, right? Like there is white people, there are black people, right? Because they would consistently pull categories apart to try to make sense of the phenomena around them. Yeah, they tried to divide reality into neat, little, tight, accurate slices of reality. Mm -hmm. And again, let me bring up the romantics or postmodernist, we can just call it since we're in a modernist type of. They didn't think that. They said that we're losing the grasp of what the human condition really is by, by doing these things. Mm -hmm. um, pace, unless uh, it's an, like a passe. Passe. I, you're right. Gertrude so, Stein. Who's Gertrude passe, Stein? Gr Gr Gertrude Stein. Feminist? I'll look it up. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Uh, but then came the law of the father and its resolution of the problem of objectivity a problem solved by always already absent reference, deferred signifieds, split subjects, and the endless play of signifiers. Who wouldn't grow up warped? Gender, race, the world itself. All seems the effects of warp speeds in the play of signifiers in a cosmic force field. I have no idea what she means by that. It was a very, very romantic sentence right there. Gender, very continental. Who wouldn't grow up warped? Gender, race, and the world itself all seem the effects of warp speeds in the play of signifiers in a cosmic force field. Interesting. In any case, do you find it, Brett, by the way? Yeah. Um, 
Gertrude Stein, uh, 1874, 1946, American novelist, poet, playwright, and collector. Uh, born in Pennsylvania, raised in Oakland, moved to France. Um, she hosted a Paris salon where leading figures of modernism in literature and art, such as Picasso, Hemingway, okay. Fitzgerald. Okay. So uh, all those pop day Gertrude Stein, all of these yeah. modernist pre-Oedipal cell team. Okay, okay, I see, I see, okay. In any yeah. case, social constructionists might maintain that the ideological doctrine of scientific method and all the philosophical verbiage about epistemology were co cooked up to distract our attention from getting to know the world effectively by practicing the sciences. Interesting. From this point of view, science, the real game in town, is rhetoric, a series of efforts to persuade relevant social actors that one's manufactured knowledge is a route to a desired form of very objective power. Such persuasions must take account of the of the structure of facts and artifacts, as well as of languages mediated actors in the knowledge game. So for which point of view specifically? In the, from the social constructionist, okay, if you just take like a radical social constructionist framework, then it follows that science, okay, you just rhetoric, the sort of efforts to pervade, okay, that's fine. Such persuasions must take account of the structure of facts and artifacts, as well as of language-mediated actors in the knowledge game. Here, artifacts and facts are part of the powerful art of rhetoric. Practice is persuasion, and the focus is very much on practice. All knowledge is a condensed node in an agnostic power field. The strong program in the sociology of knowledge joins with the lovely and nasty tools of semiology and deconstruction to insist on a rhetorical nature of truth, including scientific truth. History is a story Western culture buffs tell each other. Science is a contestable text and a power field. The content is the form. If I had to guess, I would guess I would say that she is a, or they, I don't know. They are a post-structuralist. Um, just a, a, a quick, a quick guess. But it seems like this is the common theme. Science, rather than striving towards truth, is held by these kind of people in charge, and they maintain that power, and they use that science to justify that power, and they go towards power rather than towards truth. That's kind of, and I can see, especially as a woman, and you know. In twentieth century, I could see how that may be a perspective of hers. What's interesting is I can see a lot of people who might be a bit more, you know, conspiratorial minded, read this and go, "Yeah, exactly." See, Pfizer and the COVID vaccine. There's no real hmm. science. There is no <laughs> science to back up any of these claims. They did that with Thomas Kuhn and his scientific revolutions. It's like, oh, there's a paradigm shift. That's how you know the science was wrong because look. It's wrong right here. The science, but this is, but wrong, this, right? the, the the perspective that she's elucidating now. I don't know if it's her perspective yet, right? Still very much like mm. we're not really sure what her conclusions is, but this is a very postmodern perspective, and this is a perspective that a lot of people today who decry postmodernism as an evil consistently do and act on. Yeah, and then they, th and then the throwing in and the throwing in of every topic around it. Like, exactly. Exactly. Like Scott. when someone when oh, someone sorry, says sorry. like feminism caused this, you know, this disruption or whatever we're seeing today, it's like, are you willing to acknowledge why feminism needed to come about, or do you just think it's a liberal conspiracy? You know, um, mm -hmm. can I can I read the next paragraph when we're ready? Yeah, of so. course, of course. And then we'll really be maybe another two paragraphs, and we should be done. Okay. Today's show because my butt hurts from sitting so long. <laughs> So much for those of us who would still like to talk about reality with more confidence than we allow the than we allow to the Christian right when they discuss the second coming and their being raptured out of the final <laughs> destruction of the world. We would like to think our appeals to real worlds are more than a desperate lurch away from cynicism and an act of faith like any other cults, no matter how much space we generously give to all the rich and always historically specific 
me uh, mediations through which we and everybody else must know the world. But the further I get into describing the radical social constructionist program and a particular version of postmodernism, coupled with the uh, can you move it up? Cool. Uh, coupled with the acid tools of critical discourse in the human sciences, the more nervous I get. I want to mm. repeat this last sentence. I want to make sure I understand what she's saying. Mm -hmm. The further I get into describing the radical social constructionist program and a particular version of postmodernism coupled with the acid tools of critical discourse in the human sciences, the more nervous I get. The imagery of force fields of moves in a fully textualized and coded world, which is the working metaphor in many arguments about socially uh, negotiated Negotiate. reality for the postmodern subject is, just for starters, an imaginary... Im imagery sorry of high-tech military fields of automatic automated academic battlefields where blips of light called players disintegrate each other in order to stay in the knowledge and power game i hmm. just okay i see the, the more she adopts this narrative the more she starts seeing these things like a battle a, a war between this and this where we're trying to disintegrate one another like a video game in a way, she's, as, as she adopts this perspective, these are the, the other things that come along with that perspective. This rejected, dejected perspective that she talked about, this, this myth that women were saying is in academia, right? Just a struggle for power. That's what she, she starts getting paranoid about. What I also got an intuition of, and maybe I'm just wrong about this intuition as I am many times, the more that I try... But the further I get in describing the radical social constructionist program in a particular version of postmodernism, the more nervous I get. It's almost like she's afraid of committing the very thing that she's critiquing. She's afraid of creating this axiomatic box of what mm -hmm. postmodernism mm -hmm. is, when in reality, postmodernism is just the opposite of that, that which is outside the box and ever expanding, you know, however poetic and romantic you want to get that was my initial intuition but i also like what what you just said as well about is the battle they can both be right is there a connection here or am i just putting this in my mind just by what i know about history is there a connection here with this idea and the constant competition to make bigger bombs and you know since world war ii with the atomic bomb going forward like when she says techno science and science fiction collapse into the sun of their radiant irreality war so yeah it's this ne never end having building thing of like warfare we're stronger we're better than the other we have this science our science this is all a competition and now it's partially mixed like she said with the christian right at the top of the paragraph where it's like some people are totally fine with the idea that the world could end tomorrow because they believe that the second, the second coming, coming. Yeah. is a literal thing right just like some people would think that it's a literal thing to understand science in this way or something like that. It shouldn't take decades of feminist theory to sense the enemy here. Nancy Hartstock got all this crystal clear in her concept of abstract masculinity. I think I'm going to stop here for today and maybe we'll just uh, we'll find another time. Let's run it back screen. next week or whatever. But yeah, we can run it back next week, continue the story along. So, yeah. Next week, everyone, the show is going to be this way, I believe. Again, we're going to probably watch a video, respond to something, talk about something fun, and we'll continue reading the story and this paper. If you're interested, I'll link it in the chat. We can all kind of read it on our own and maybe get back to it later or however we want to do it. So cool. with, that, with that being said, everyone... Uh, have a good night. And uh, what is is this David Hume on my half, on, on your face, Perry? <laughs> I'm sorry. It is it is uh, it is pretty disingenuous to do that. You know, I am nowhere as mighty of a thinker as he is. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I ought I ought not idol idolize. And but maybe I mean same thing with this guy, right? I'll never Marcus Aurelius. But no, you'll never you'll never I'll never be who he was. But look at, look at that beard.
Yeah, I mean, imagine the, the the amount of artistic prowess to do that to a man's beard with like stone. That's just oh yeah, it's crazy, un unba unba freaking livable. Well, anyhow, have a good night, everyone, and we'll see you around next time. And as always, stay thinking. <laughs>